Good afternoon, it's Thursday the 9th of June 2016, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson, and joining me in the studio again, Patrick Henningsen. Great to be with you, Mike. It's uh, a pleasant day in Plymouth today, Very nice quite day. warm in the studio, uh, and uh, heating up uh, with regard to the EU referendum, uh, because, uh, well, they keep pushing back the uh, deadline for voter registration, um, and uh, it seems this is being caused by uh, various IT glitches. Now, there have been a number of IT glitches uh, with uh, regard to the EU referendum. This from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the Electoral Commission admitting that a software glitch, in inverted commas, led to referendum voting cards being sent to EU citizens. Oops. Uh, oops. Uh, EU citizens, of course, unless you're Irish, EU citizens uh, not allowed to vote in this uh, referendum. Um, so uh, that was a mistake. Uh, but this uh, latest problem, uh, because the uh, government website keeps crashing every time somebody goes to try to register to vote. Um, and, uh, well, Patrick, it just sort of struck me that there was a bit of a precedent for this, um, because, of course, it all began with uh, Royal Bank of Scotland. But here uh, we've got the FT article from uh, a week or so ago, uh, because uh, a Deutsche Bank IT glitch meant that customers couldn't access their cash, they couldn't transfer money, they couldn't pull money out of cash machines. How inconvenient. It's so inconvenient that as soon as anybody gets into a bit of trouble, there's a, it's blamed on an IT glitch. Imagine registering to vote, going to the website, registering to vote, and the site crashes. Yeah. Terribly inconvenient, especially when you consider who all the new uh, voters are, people who aren't registered, who are going to register. What camp do you think they might be voting in? Well, uh, and, uh, well indeed, all these uh, new registrants apparently are um, younger people mm. uh, who are perceived to perhaps be wanting to vote for, to remain. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so, so they say. So they say. But there's also a, a silent majority in this country that aren't aren't voting, who are probably also pro uh, remain as well, or sorry, to to leave. leave. So uh, that that's not borne out in the polls, depending on what polls you read. But it's yes. very interesting. Yes, uh, and uh, more in the media about Northern Ireland. And today, uh, John Major and Tony Blair, best of friends when it suits them. Um, are apparently making a, an appeal, a joint EU appeal, uh, because of course uh, Northern Ireland uh, is the whole peace process, process is going to fall apart if we leave the EU. Uh, and uh, so. Uh, That's a fetching photo there of the young Blair, isn't the it? The young Blair and a young John Major, this relatively a, speaking. A young, up and coming, idealistic uh, Anthony Linton Blair, there with uh, then Prime Minister, I believe, yes. John Major. Yes. Who uh, no one has really seen for the last decade and a half, and all of a sudden he... He just pops up out of the woodwork. He appears out of nowhere to campaign for the EU referendum. So With his Carlisle Group salary. So it's interesting that they would have both of those former prime ministers from separate parties uh, together campaigning for one side uh, of the issue. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So the big guns are out, Mike. Yes, and of course... Uh, they are suggesting, as we mentioned yesterday, they're suggesting that uh, the Northern Irish border would then become the hard border for the European Union uh, between the UK and the EU. Uh, this is uh, Theresa Villiers, uh, who's the shadow Northern Ireland uh, spokesperson, saying that uh, such a hard border, uh, the idea of it is a bit far-fetched. Now, as Alex Thompson pointed out yesterday, it's not only far-fetched, it's simply incorrect because the uh, protocols, the treaties uh, regarding that border existed from before we uh, joined the European Union. So that uh, goes into more of the PSYOP. Um, so they're using Ireland as a uh, cannon fodder yes. uh, to influence the public opinion, public perception on the EU issue. Yes. So desper total desperation and uh, all, none of it based in reality, most of it based in fantasy. Total fantasy. Uh, now, what perhaps isn't total fantasy is the continuing threats uh, that are being made should there be a vote to leave. Uh, William Hague uh, now is suggesting that uh, such a vote would fragment the entire Western world. There you go. But of course, we've had a whole bunch of other threats over the last few weeks about attacks on our currency, uh, attacks on this, attacks on that, uh, people losing their jobs, trade collapsing. Uh, so um, many of these threats, however, 
I personally think are probably genuine, particularly the, the suggestion of an attack on Britain's currency, um, the, uh, the central or the banking system uh, and certain players, should we mention George Soros once again, absolutely have demonstrated that they have the, uh, the capability of attacking a currency in this way. So some of these threats perhaps shouldn't be taken too lightly. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, as uh, Nigel Farage said on the so-called debate the other night, um, we can't be held to ransom by these uh, globalist players. Well, if you look at Greece as an example, uh, there was a country that was uh, threatening to leave the Eurozone uh, not just recently, and look at the barrage of attacks uh, from different angles uh, that the establishment, especially the banking establishment, financial, central banking, they attacked Greece and destroyed it. Destroyed it. If you go to Greece right now, Greece is very close to being categorized as a third world country. Mm. Uh, it's cash poor, services are not running full time, uh, people are not being paid salaries, it's an absolute crisis. Utilities are not always being delivered uh, um, the way that they normally were before. Mm. And this is total uh, as a result of predatory finan uh, finance yeah. on that country. So that, that could happen with Britain, but more likely, Mike, this is William Hague. Uh, again, haven't heard much from Hague, uh, just like Major, and there he is, uh, appearing right now to uh, more fear-mongering. Mm. So, yeah, they could be genuine threats, Mike, but more likely this is uh, more the sort of... Um, uh, sensational uh, scaremongering going on by by the establishment. This is, have we said this? I don't know if we said this on the show last week, but it's very similar to the Scot the run up to the Scottish referendum. Yes. In terms of uh, the politicians who are coming out, the media, but what was the result of the Scottish referendum? A total realignment uh, of the uh, Scottish uh, political uh, uh, makeup. So this Brexit will be used, I believe, also. It looks like it could be used, like Scotland, to, to realign the party in power yes. in this country, yes. which is the Conservative Party. Yes. So we'll see. Well, so, um, I think it was uh, Mark Mardell saying that we could have a general election by Christmas, uh, no matter the outcome. Hmm. Um, so perhaps we will have um, Boris by then. Yeah, it could be. It could be if you go by God Scottish. <laughs> if you go by the Scottish uh, model. as a model, yeah. as a template, uh, that is what might happen. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay, let's move on. Um, MI6, the Crown Prosecution Service, they've been up to no good. Well, here we have an uh, interesting character. Here, this is uh, in the photo. This is uh, Abdel Hakim Belhaj. Now he's an interesting fellow. So he's complaining that uh, he and his family were uh, abused, and uh, I, I believe. A report was filed even with the CPS. Uh, well, so you have the MI6 on one side, the CPS on the other, uh, and uh, accusations of abuse. Who is Abdel Hakim Belhaj? He's a, a, a alumni of Guantanamo Bay. Right. So he was... Uh, an he, alumni? He's an alumni of Gitmo, and he's also an alumni of the Afghan Mujahideen, right. which was for all historical purposes under the control of the CIA. And so here he is uh, detained in 2004, brought to Gitmo, and he was released just in time for the Libyan uh, over the overthrow, NATO's overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya. He was released in 2010. He led the Islamic fighting groups in Libya, and he's now appointed governor of Tripoli. So he's a de facto one of the viceroys of Tripoli. Okay. Wow. This is a double agent. Yes. So here we have a double agent who is uh, basically fronting a legal false flag against the concept of extraordinary rendition. Yeah. It's, 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 that's what it looks like to me, the story. So completely planted, totally stage managed. The front man is a double agent, ex Gitmo alumni, Mujahideen alumni. Uh, Adrian says, alumnus, surely. Alumnus, <laughs> yeah, alumnus. <laughs> so, um, and he used to be known as um, uh, Abu Abdullah al Siddiq back in his Afghan Mujahideen days. And uh, I think that was his, um, uh, his name that he used it while he was working with the CIA, I But guess. certainly a recruit, yeah. Yeah, yes. so interesting. So this, this is how it works. Um, and uh, so not as all what it appears to be with yeah. some of these characters coming out of Gitmo. That was exposed in the Penny Lane scandal. Yeah. Taking some of these people who are detainees and redeploying them out into the field. With, into, with, a, with a new credibility because they've spent time inside. Absolutely. Yeah. 
it, the, the law enforcement does this all the time with yes. informants, so yes. uh, this is no different. <laughs> okay, well, let's move from the CIA in some regard to the FBI. And, uh, of course, in the United States, you have a, a battle very similar to, to what's going on over here with regard to the Snoopers Charter. Uh, and uh, at the heart of it are the usual suspects of Facebook and Google. So here's uh, FBI Director James Comey. Uh, who could be on the way out in a couple of months uh, if there's a, a regime change in the White House, mm -hmm. party change. But So this is very similar to the story that uh, I think you covered this before with the Snoopers Charter and uh, wanting access to uh, everyone's web browser histories. Yep. And so this is a key component here. F uh, apparently, Facebook and Google are supposedly fighting back here, but uh, you know the close relationship between Google uh, and big companies like Google and Facebook with the U.S. government, with the NSA, the coziness uh, in which they rub shoulders even at Bilderberg meetings and things like this. Yes. The establishment, I, I doubt that there is genuine pushback there. There might be in terms of customer perception yeah. a, big, a big issue for someone like Google or Facebook who doesn't want to shed uh, any users or, or revenue because they might appear to be working against the interests of, of their users. Uh, I think that's, uh, that was my perception of the Apple case with the iPhone um, uh, encryption, encryption yeah. business. Uh, I felt that was a, a PR exercise more than anything else. Yeah, did they hack it in the end? Uh, well, the FBI um, gave it to a third party company with, I believe, with Israeli links who, who, and spent a couple of million dollars um, taking it apart physically, I think. And they cracked it. And they cracked it, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, but sticking with the FBI then, um, ISIS. Well, this, this is related to the um, Abdel um, Hakim Belhash story. So this is the FBI stepping up its use of stings in ISIS cases. Like this is a major announcement. Like right. we're going to start doing stings. Well, the reality is the FBI has been doing stings. That's all they've been doing actually uh, since 9-11, since before 9-11. And there's an extraordinary statistic, which I don't have at hand, but something close to maybe 90% of all terrorist uh, cases involving informants or some sort of sting. Sting is a euphemism for the word entrapment. Mm. And I think uh, anybody who works in counterterrorism should probably be aware that there's a large degree of the sting is, an, is entrapment, mm. whereby the FBI create the cell, they recruit members of the cell, they train, they give them money to buy bomb materials, and then when they show up at the gun store or whatever, the cars are waiting and they make the big arrest. This is how it's done in America. So this is a case, Mike, of if there's no real terror threats, well, we can just create them ourselves. So that's kind of what I think the, the FBI is doing with taxpayer money, is really creating a lot of uh, terror uh, incidents and making convictions out of them and big announcements and press conferences when the arrests are made. And yet uh, one of the world's biggest terrorists, Hillary Clinton, uh, still seems to avoid uh, indictment through the FBI. Yeah, yeah, so so far, so we'll see. I mean, this is like the sword of Damocles over, <laughs> her, over her neck for the uh, election cycle. So a lot of people are talking about it. It's funny how many people are actually talking about mm. this in the mainstream, mm. uh, even on the Democratic side. Uh, so is there any reality to those, to the possibility that she may get indicted after she's been named the Democratic nominee? I don't know, I think there's still a possibility that wow. this could happen. It depends who really is in power in Washington. Yes. Yes, okay, okay, well, we've, let's move on to Syria quickly. This is just a brief one. Uh, this is in Russian, of course, uh, but this is uh, a spokesperson from the Russian Defense Ministry, uh, perhaps no surprise, uh, suggesting that uh, 160 uh, new militants, new uh, al-Nusra Front uh, personnel have uh, moved across from Turkey, where undoubtedly they were being trained. Now, who, who could possibly have been training those guys? <laughs> I have no idea. It uh, could be... Who pretty, runs the training camps in Turkey? <laughs> well, the, the U.S. has a, a very big military footprint in Turkey. Um, British Special Forces are no doubt using Turkey as a staging ground. French Special Forces uh, and a number of terrorist groups. Al-Nusra itself uses Turkey as a launching pad. ISIS uses Turkey as a launching pad. So who knows? Take your pick, Mike. Yeah. But it's all terrorism at the end of the day. Yes. Uh, and uh, a pretty, the, the uh, shenanigans over Yemen and uh, the Saudi Arabia blacklisting continues. Um, so we uh, spoke about this over the last couple of days. Rights groups urging the United Nations to put the uh, Saudi Yemen 
coalition back on the blacklist. Uh, but we see uh, a couple of reports. Well, uh, this is uh, the Star uh, reporting that uh, the UN chief, uh, this is Ban Ki Moon, uh, has uh, was facing cut off of funding uh, and allegedly a fatwa risk. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, Vanessa Bailey has uh, published an article on 21st Century Wire today on this. So what's the background here? Was this a genuine uh, physical threat? Yeah, this, this, is, this is international racketeering uh, within UN membership. So this is kind of extraordinary. So Ban Ki-moon will henceforth be known as Ban Cave Moon uh, because he has caved in to uh, international racketeering by the Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation, the uh, IOC, which is uh, another front for the GCC, which is a front for uh, a very close-knit group of tribes who have appointed themselves the rightful rulers of mm -hmm. Arabia and uh, divvied that up amongst themselves with the help of the British and, uh, and others back in the day yes. with St. John Philby. So uh, what, what's happened here? Saudi Arabia was put on a blacklist under pressure from human rights groups about uh, child uh, atrocities in Yemen uh, at the hands of the Saudi-led coalition uh, as they bomb and uh, mm. maim and destroy people's lives in Yemen. Uh, someone found their moral backbone in the UN and put them on, then on a blacklist mm. uh, for violation of child's rights, which in itself is a bit of a red herring, because what about all the tens of thousands of adults who have mm. been slaughtered mm. and civilians? But anyway, on the issue of child rights. And so Saudi was upset they were put on this blacklist. And so the threats came, the bullying. They threatened to pull funding from the United Nations uh, uh, Relief Workers Agency for Palestine. And apparently Saudi has put $100 million into that organization. Right. So, and, the, and it's funny, all, all roads lead back to Israel in this. And what was interesting is in uh, 2015, Israel was going to be put on this blacklist. But under heavy lobbying by the U.S. to Ban Ki-moon then caved in and over the Gaza siege or the population reduction yes. exercise in Gaza in 2014 where Israel bombed and destroyed uh, 50, I don't know how many thousands of homes and killed 1,500 uh, Gazans. Um, Israel wasn't put on the list because of lobbying and threats made by the U.S. So what's... Although what Saudi's done here with and, and Qatar and other GCC members is horrible, the U.S. did the same thing mm. on behalf of Israel last year. So the, the U.N. is so corrupt now, Mike. It's, they're really working to collapse the reputation of the U.N. using Saudi Arabia and some of these um, uh, bellicose, um, misbehaving members uh, to really collapse the, the reputation of this organization in a really fast way. And, and what, what do you think is the reason for that? Is it because it has the word nation in the name? Is it because it's based on the idea of nations and, and that idea is now, we are now post the democratic era, post the Westphalian nation, uh, the notion of that? Is that, is that what's mean, going on there? I think so. And you look, look at how the Saudi Arabia is throwing its weight around, Mike calling anybody who's uh, accusing them of war crimes as anti-Muslim, telling their clerics, getting them together and raising fatwas against the UN. This should give you an ex uh, some indication of how Saudi Arabia rules over its own people mm. within its own borders, mm. okay? This is not a democracy. This is not a, a modern, civilized country. This is an absolute dictatorial monarchy that runs a kind of a medieval uh, agenda when it comes to its... Uh, uh, social management. So, and this is basically who has bought their way onto the UN Human Rights Council and uh, then was criticized and now is using, throwing its money and its threats and its weight to get itself removed from a blacklist, mm. a human rights blacklist. This is absolutely astounding mm. in this day and age that this could be allowed to happen. And this is total international lawlessness, mm. Mike. That, that, that's the only way to describe it. Well, every yeah. time every time I hear Cameron discuss the rules-based international order, I know that what he's talking about is the absolute opposite. Yeah, so total he, lawlessness. And we see Cameron, President Obama going over, paying homage to the Saudi monarchs, saying, "Please buy our aircraft, please buy our weapon systems, please buy our radar systems," mm. and they sell them, and they have. Mm. It's been a bumper year for arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Yep. Okay. Well. Um, Getting back to the West then and NATO and Russia. Uh, this is uh, Der Spiegel. 
Uh, and uh, they are commenting on Operation uh, Anaconda, which we've mentioned uh, a few times over the last few days. Uh, big NATO exercise. Uh, and uh, they're saying that, um, Der Spiegel is saying that really this is a step too far for NATO, that NATO is quite clearly playing out a scenario of a real war with Russia being the, the target of this, uh, that it's too clear, clearly aimed at Moscow. Uh, and, uh, and they're saying that actually Poland is a, playing a large part in driving this, so they're blaming Poland for this. Now, um, they're saying that Warsaw is acting intentionally, provocatively, thus uh, it invited Georgia and Ukraine to take part in Anaconda, in Anaconda 16. Uh, both would like to take, be part of NATO, but the alliance has rejected this idea so far. Uh, for the Polish, that doesn't matter. Uh, Warsaw has declared the NATO-Russia founding act, the basic agreement with Moscow, obsolete. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, as we were discussing before the program, Patrick, Poland uh, the, has a conservative government in place at the moment, uh, very church-oriented, uh, but they still... Uh, blame Russia for the, uh, the Smolensk plane crash. Um, and um, I think we both agree that perhaps looking east is not the direction for the, for the, the solution to that, that particular plane crash. Looking west is much more likely. Um, so uh, Poland is being played by the west here. It, it is, and I'm disappointed that De Spiegel would even give any credence to that line that Poland is somehow driving this problem. And the day when the German intelligentsia will step up and say that Poland is being played by, by the international banks, by the ECB, by everybody who's looking and who has already asset stripped that country. We were talking about before mm. the show, Poland's been effectively asset stripped uh, after its uh, membership into the EU. If they join the single currency, that's it for Poland. That, that, that will, they will wipe that country out so fast, they will just devalue everything in that country, and the standard of living will drop. And well, it's already happened to a large degree. And it's suffering from the worst brain drain yeah. uh, in Europe, arguably. Yeah. So Poland is, in my view, is a, definitely a victim of the EU super state gobbling it up chewing it up and then spitting out the, the, the remnants of it. So yeah. that, that's the problem there. The, what they do have a point, though, is that it is mimicking a real war. Okay, that I would say, Der Spiegel has made a good point there. Right. Um, and it is, uh, point, guns are pointed at Russia. This is not a simulation for anything else, but to ramp up tensions between the East and the West. And again, this fuels and justifies the existence of NATO or of an EU army, which might be coming behind it. Yes. Okay, well, um, look, uh, uh, I want to highlight this article in Russia Insi Insider from Eric Zeus, but before I talk about it, I'll just mention that uh, last night uh, we were doing what's almost the final edit on the first uh, edition, new edition of uh, Insight, uh, in which Eric Zeus took part, uh, and we're very grateful for that. So, so uh, we will hopefully release that uh, version, that uh, new episode of Insight um, early next week. Yeah, Eric's a great uh, veteran analyst uh, based, based in the United States, and uh, he's been studying geopolitics and uh, these issues that we talk about every day for uh, the better part of uh, 40, 50, 40 or yeah. 50 years. Yes. So a great, a great resource. Um, so in this article published in Russia Insider, he is basically uh, suggesting that Obama has said to Putin, drop dead. Uh, and uh, he's saying uh, Russia's concern is that if the ballistic missile defense or anti-ballistic missile system that the United States is now just starting to install on and near Russia's borders works, then the United States will be able to launch a surprise nuclear attack against uh, Russia, and this system uh, could annihilate the, uh, will annihilate the missiles that Russia launches in retaliation, which will then leave the Russian population uh, with no retaliation at all. And this is a point uh, I've heard him make a few times, uh, that um, while these types of defense systems um, give they give one side uh, such an advantage over the other uh, that the other has to see that as not a defensive act it's a threat it's a direct threat because you've 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 effectively removed any op any opportunity for the other side to retaliate for uh, for uh, your actions yeah. and therefore it removes any uh, any sort of uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for 
that's gone out of my head. And any kind of uh, well, any chance to reciprocate or to 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 retaliate. Yeah, but it also removes a, a, any likelihood that one that the that the side with the defense system will will withhold their actions. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, and it has to do with the distance in the flight time, right? As well, to, if you get down to to technicalities. But Eric did talk about that in the insight. Uh, yes, that he really gave a good, ex simple explanation. It's, it, Russia's got its hands tied behind its back. The closer that defense system gets pushed up against the Russian borders. Uh, absolutely. So, so it's interesting then that uh, uh, in Sputnik here, in light of this uh, provocation, I mean, this extreme provocation, um, that uh, they're suggesting that Russia is keeping it cool. Mm -hmm. uh, now, they're not in keep, keeping it entirely cool. Uh, but this uh, this uh, Sputnik uh, report saying uh, that uh, the, the Russia is not venturing uh, to do anything particularly aggressive. They're not going to dramatize the exercise. They're going to keep an eye on it. They're going to watch it. Uh, they don't think that the exercise is wise. Uh, they view it as a provocation uh, and so on, but they're not going to do anything particularly stupid. Uh, however, uh, as uh, Reuters is pointing out today, they're not taking no action. Uh, they are taking some. Uh, they are moving troops westward. They're setting up uh, new uh, bases stretching from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea uh, and Reuters here saying each side says it's only responding to steps taken by the other uh, but the build-up risks, risks locking NATO and Russia in a spiral of measure and countermeasure uh, from which it will be difficult to escape. What, what, what the starting a kind of a smaller uh, beginnings of an arms uh, an arms race. Yes. And so the, the, in the past... But, but it's, it's much more dangerous because in the past the arms race was separated by thousands of miles. Right. Now they're right up against each they're other. Right up against each other. And, and maybe uh, for the Russian political um, domestic life, this, what NATO is doing here is a boon for Vladimir Putin. It's a boon for his party as well, because mm. it's showing that there's a, a direct threat against the Russian homeland. Mm. So uh, they're really solidifying the power base, much like the Washington and, and its allies have done this in Syria. They've absolutely elevated public opinion in favor of Bashar al-Assad by funding and arming crazy jihadists to besiege that country. Likewise, NATO is doing the same for Russia. So, but in terms of the arm race, they hope that they could bankrupt Russia, rush the Russian economy's weak, get them to spend more on defense. Um, this was the received wisdom uh, in the latter part of the Cold War, and that we supposedly won the Cold War based mm -hmm. on this bankrupting the Soviet Union uh, strategy. But I don't think this is, we're living in the same uh, world as the 1980s, so uh, the, the, the sort of money that's being spent, Russia is very carefully and measuredly expanding its uh, domestic defense. Mm. But in terms of NATO, just look at it, Mike, like a, like this is an arms show. This is a trade show. The video you, we showed on the news yes, yesterday, sir. that's just to uh, bolster the profile of the defense contractors who have stuff at the Excel Center uh, coming up in September or whatever arms show around the world, and their job is to move product. Mm. And it, if NATO seem to be active or they can hype up the Russian threat, all the better for sales of Lockheed Martin Boeing and all these uh, corporations. Yeah, yes. Okay, well, this is uh, an interesting Russia-related story, and, and I could see how many people would uh, view this with cynicism. Uh, so this is the Moscow Times. First of all, we say that this is Moscow Times quite oriented towards NATO and the West, to say the least. Yeah, don't let the title deceive you. Uh, when you see Moscow Times on the Internet, it's not really a Moscow newspaper. Um, it's very much a, a sort of a Western creation, if you will. Right. So the headline is, Why has Israel sent uh, Russia an historic tank? Uh, and this is a Majak 3 Israeli tank heading to a Moscow museum. It has arrived in Moscow uh, yesterday. And this is uh, part of an exchange between Russian and Israeli governments. Uh, they, uh, the Russians have also sent a tank over to Israel for a museum there. Uh, and uh, we have been hearing, you know, over the last uh, few weeks and months, Patrick, that, uh, that Putin and Netanyahu are starting to speak a bit more. There's a lot more uh, interaction between them. Uh, and I suppose the more cynical would say that here is another world leader who's just taking a, a pro-Zionist uh, uh, position. Uh, but perhaps there's more to it than meets the eye. Yeah, I think that's kind of an... O it, it, that would be what a lot of people are saying. It's kind of an oversimplification. If you look at what Russia is involved in the Middle East, literally partnering with, partnering with Syria. Syria is at war with Israel. 
uh, effectively yeah. under war, war conditions. Uh, so they have a peace treaty or some sort of peace agreement in the Golan Heights separating the militaries of those two countries. But mm -hmm. Israel has struck Syria uh, six or seven times uh, aggressively by air in the last two years. Okay, so they're, they're at war with Syria. Russia is partnering with Syria, yet Russia is going and doing diplomacy with Israel. Mm. Russia is going to do whatever it takes uh, in its own interests to uh, advance whatever its agenda is. Mm. Okay, and right now Russia is almost at war with Turkey. They're very much on tender feet right now mm. between those two countries. And Turkey is... Uh, patching up its relations with Israel. There was a quote by, a, a, I think it was a, a Turkish or Israeli minister only two days ago, they're one or two meetings away, he said, from normalizing relations between Israel and Turkey. So look at this matrix. So Russia at odds with Turkey, Turkey patching it up with Israel, Israel uh, not so good with Syria, Turkey completely at war with Syria. Mm. It's an absolute mess. And Russia is doing what it does best which is diplomacy. Look at how uh, Sergei Lavrov has performed on the world stage since this crisis began. Yes. Masterful. So I wouldn't second guess uh, what Russia is doing for a second in comparison to look how the U.S. has performed abysmally uh, on the international stage. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we were going to cover this yesterday, but we ran out of time, so we gave it a miss and we thought we'd cover it today. Uh, British Navy, Navy intercepting a Russian submarine on the way to the channel. Uh, not sure how close they were to the channel in the uh, North Sea, maybe, or, or somewhere in the mid-Atlantic, not quite <laughs> sure. Uh, but uh, our friend Michael Fallon made a comment. He said, this shows the way the Navy is maintaining a vigilant watch in international and territorial waters to keep Britain safe and protect us from potential threats. Po what, what do you make of that? Potential then? being the operative <laughs> word there. Uh, <laughs> So the, the hunt for Red October uh, resumes uh, somewhere uh, in the vicinity of the English Channel. They didn't say exactly where. Yeah. So that could be 100, 200 miles, 300 miles from the Channel. I mean, the routine escorts, the British frigate will routinely escort a foreign submarine through British waters, even during the Cold War. So this, I don't know how you can make a real, make a story out of this. No, there is. It's kind of desperate it's, it's, on the part of the yes, Guardian, I yes. think. Uh, but to, to gin up some sort of Russian threat. I think if Brian were here, he would be pointing out that submarines don't like the channel too much. <laughs> this is it's, not, it's deep not deep enough. enough. <laughs> So. Yes. Uh, well, but staying on the subject of uh, submarines, uh, RT covering this, the Times covering this today as well, uh, that Britain is secretly upgrading its nukes without asking MPs. Now, what are they doing? They're, they're putting some research and development into, into the next generation Trident warheads. Uh, but uh, this isn't quite what it seems, is it? It's not. It's not. You know, and the whole Trident issue, Mike, is to me uh, a gigantic uh, red, red herring for lack of a better term, we've used that already in the show. But uh, the, the reality of Trident is this. Um, the Trident submarines, those are U.S. warheads with U.S. guidance systems, U.S. software, U.S. GPS. They have to be serviced at the U.S. Uh, nuclear naval facility in uh, Georgia uh, every year. And uh, who knows, there's talk that the U.S. even have the launch codes although I haven't been able to confirm that. But that's part of the, uh, the U.S.-British defense agreement of 1958. This is a treaty between the two countries. So in effect, uh, the U.S. kind of almost owns and operates the British nuclear deterrent. Mm. Uh, and, so the, and also the British nuclear plants, a lot of them are also operated by Lockheed Martin, by Halliburton and Serco that con the international consortium, but that's a U.S.-led consortium. So mm. how much of Britain's nuclear arsenal is Britain's uh, is a good question. How or, much of Britain's anything is Britain's anymore? So, uh, so the, talk, the, the talk of this is a big defense issue. It's kind of a joke. Yeah. Uh, what it does, however, Mike, it is it, the nuclear weapons are important because it allows Britain to be on the U.N. Security Council. Mm. That's why, that's the special elite club of the International Security Club. Mm. And you have to have nukes to be on it. Mm. And without the nuclear deterrent, an argument could be made that Britain shouldn't sit on the UN Security Council. Mm. So that's why it's important. So you can make decisions and block uh, resolutions and protect Israel and condemn Syria, et cetera. Yeah. Or bomb Libya. Or bomb Libya. Yeah, yeah indeed. Okay, let's move on. Finance then. Uh, uh, 
This is an interesting, a couple of interesting stories here. So this is a Japanese bank, the Tokyo uh, Mitsubishi uh, URJ Limited, a uh, huge bank in uh, being described here as a mega bank uh, in uh, Tokyo. Uh, and they have decided that they are uh, getting out of uh, bonds, the, out of the bond market. Uh, and uh, that means they can no longer trade bonds. They can't buy government bonds. Uh, and uh, this report here noting that uh, this is going to could potentially have a ripple effect among uh, other major participating banks. But what this ultimately boils down to is that um, this large, huge bank is effectively separating itself from the Japanese central bank, separating its relationship. Uh, and this, we're seeing a slightly different angle on this, but the same type of, uh, of situation with Commerce Bank, another mega bank, this is in Germany. Uh, and they are talking about uh, separating themselves from the European Central Bank on the basis of negative interest rates. Uh, and uh, uh, people saying that this could effectively render the uh, European Central Bank's negative interest rate policy ineffective. Um, now, we're going to talk a bit more about this with David Scott tomorrow, but I just wanted to, to highlight though that it's a quite an interesting situation within the banking system if banks are starting to argue with what is effectively the central governance mechanism uh, within the banking sector. So we'll keep an eye on that and cover that a bit more tomorrow. And the, the, the math doesn't add up, Mike, and this is probably out of survival. Uh, uh, absolutely the, out of survival, the, the, yes. The, ne the negative interest rate uh, world, this fantasy world uh, that we've been living in for the last few years, the math does not add up in, in terms of uh, even they won't be here in five years. But that's Commerce Bank's uh, point of view, the position. It's costing them so much money, they can't afford to do it. Uh, but, but what we're looking at is, is a, a potential breakup of the, of the sort of uh, agreements that there have been amongst the banking elites. A breakup of the cartel. Yes. So this, this is what you're looking at here. Yeah. This is the kind of a serious situation for the ECB because this is a referendum against negative interest rates. Is but, but this is the same in Japan. So, so you know, this is not just a European problem. Yeah. That's when, they, the, when they start voting with their feet, uh, yeah, big changes are coming. Yes. Yes. OK, well, let's uh, talk about UK steel. Um, now, this, uh, there was a meeting of the uh, Steel Council yesterday, uh, and they agreed plans uh, to undertake what they're calling new research into future market opportunities. That's good. It all sounds very good. This is a talking shop, a forum, which is chaired by Sajid Javid there. Uh, and uh, uh, he, uh, well, what did he say? He said, thousands of workers, businesses and communities up and down the country depend on the steel industry for their livelihoods. And I'm determined to ensure a long-term sustainable future. Uh, and that's why I sold it off to a private equity firm. No, he didn't say that. That last sentence he didn't say, mm -hmm. but but that that's that's pretty much what he was. Uh, that that is what he has done. Uh, now, uh, what was one of the uh, organisations that was uh, at this meeting uh, was the new British Steel, uh, and this is the uh, the company which has been set up. The new uh, British Steel. Yes, new British. Better than the old British well, Steel. No, no, and we'll t we'll explain now why it's not. This is the British Steel. So they should call it. here they are. There is British Steel building stronger futures. So this is part of Tata Steel hived off into a new limited company. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, just to remind everybody what they did uh, when they came up with this agreement, they agreed a wage cut uh, for all the people that work there. They agreed an end to bonuses. So no great incentive to work hard. Uh, and they uh, ended the final salary pension scheme. So yet another final salary pension scheme bites the dust. Now, this uh, company, British Steel Limited, um, has arisen through an agreement with uh, this lot, Greybull Capital. Uh, so this is a what some people would call a vulture capital fund. Uh, they uh, go around, uh, they're, they're a private equity company, they go around spending money on, on companies. They bought, uh, they bought British Steel, the assets, uh, and the liabilities, in fairness, but they bought the assets for a pound. Uh, so this is one of these deals where you buy up a lot of stuff for a pound and then you, uh, well, will they asset strip it? That remains to be seen. Uh, Grey Bull Capital 
uh, have four uh, main members, Nathaniel, Jerome, Mayonhas, uh, Mark Mayonhas, uh, Richard, Cal, uh, Pearl Hagen, and, uh, and another body, uh, which I believe is now, uh, now long, no longer exists, Grey Bull Co Corporate Partner Limited. So, so there was possibly a bit of offshoring going on there, not yes. quite sure. It's like the new Mayfair set. Well, uh, and uh, well, if we just take uh, Nathaniel Mahoyas, Mahoyas as, as uh, uh, an example, uh, he was, is what's described as a French London-based businessman. Uh, he was a principal with Sun Capital Partners earlier in his career. He was an investment banker with Lehman Brothers. So he's got a good uh, track record there. Excellent. Uh, and uh, if we remember uh, this company, of course, they were one of the investors in Comet. Uh, and uh, this uh, retailer, of course, went out of business in 2012. Comet was another one of these companies that was bought for almost no money. Uh, and then the organizations, including Greybull, uh, they walked away with 117 million pounds at the end of it. Nice bit of work. Uh, so there. a nice bit of work, uh, and of course that that was uh, a lot of that money uh, sent through a shell company in Guernsey. Uh, so uh, so there's no offshoring going on there at all. No, it's just Jimmy Goldsmith and uh, Mohammed Al Fayed. They'd be smiling right now. <clears throat> so so clearly yes, indeed. So so clearly uh, uh, you know. Mr. Javid, really keen to see uh, Britain's steel business uh, succeed uh, by uh, selling it off to private equity firm. It's, they should rename it from British Steel to British Spiel. Yes. Because it's a spiel that's being delivered. It's, well, it's an old one at that. Well, here's a bit more of it, because uh, this was uh, being tweeted out today, or uh, possibly uh, well, it, was, it was being tweeted out today. This is a YouTube video from RT uh, regarding the uh, selling off of Britain's uh, public assets in, in London. Uh, now, this is a, a subject that I've been looking at for quite a long time um, because uh, in the last budget, uh, the, of course, uh, George Osborne had stated uh, that he was uh, running the largest privatization this country had ever seen. Um, and I just wanted to remind everybody that I had, in fact, written a freedom of information request to the Treasury uh, asking for details about what was being sold. Um, and uh, it was quite an interesting response I got because initially they didn't want to tell me. So I put in a, a, uh, an internal review and eventually they wrote back and they said, uh, the review has considered your request and found that your original request refer referred to the sale of government assets referenced in the Chancellor's quote regarding privatizations. Uh, a link to this information was provided in our response. Uh, your internal review request refers to sale of smaller assets such as government buildings, land, and other property. So basically what that refers to is that I had asked about uh, Osborne's comments in the budget. Uh, they had took that to mean one thing, and they basically sent me a register which had already been published by the BBC of some of the really large sales that they, that they you know, the multi-billion pound sales. Uh, and I said, yes, but this doesn't include um, all the other assets that are being sold off. Um, so there's no, and you know, you may feel that an asset which is uh, worth less than 100 million pounds is too small to even consider. But in fact, we don't know how many of these 100 million pound assets are being sold, so we don't know what the scale of this is could be, uh, globally. Could, could be it could be hundreds of 10 <coughs> or 20 be, million pound assets. Uh, or uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and when you add those all up, of course, that becomes billions very, billions. very quickly. Yeah. Um, so anyway, they went on and they said, uh, we can confirm that the Treasury does not hold this information in the format you have requested. This is because... This is because we do not hold a central searchable database of such sales from which we can extract this information, right? Uh, but then they go on to say, the reason that your request exceeds the cost limit is that any relevant information could be contained in very many files. Searching all those might contain relevant information to determine whether the Treasury holds any information relevant to your request would exceed the appropriate limit. So on one hand, they say they don't maintain records, on the other hand, they say they've got too many records to search and therefore it would cost too much. So it's pretty unclear exactly uh, what the Treasury is actually up to here. That, that last line you read, Mike, could, could, could have been a line out of Terry Gilliam's Brazil. Absolutely. The, 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 the Ministry of Information Retrieval. And, and that's the response you get. Yes. Totally cryptic. Uh, yeah, I don't know. They did not. They did not. They do not want to tell people what they're selling off. So the only way we have of knowing what's being sold is when a particular sale comes to the notice of the media and it ends up in the newspapers. But the Treasury is trying to say in their response to me that they don't have a central database of uh, 
of records of what they're selling. They don't know how much property they're selling. This is a treasury. This is a, a lie. So if they, I, if they don't say, have the information, who does? Well, exactly. It's just numbers on a, on a ledger, right? And, and the Treasury has responsibility for maintaining records for the nation. So they're trying to tell us they don't know. There's I an, think not. And there's not an invoice? Mm. Exactly. Know, exactly. Okay, finally then, uh, Tim Berners-Lee. Oh, no. Uh, yes, I think this is the final one. Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, he, uh, of course, the founder of the uh, creator of the World Wide Web, uh, nearly 30 years ago. Uh, and he's uh, uh, commenting on the fact that uh, websites uh, are really held on individual servers or an in a, a individual group of servers. They are single points of failure. Uh, they're subject to spying, to blocking, to tracking, and so on. Uh, he says the web controls what people see, creates mechanisms for how people interact. It's been great, but spying, blocking sites, repurposing people's content, taking you to the wrong websites, that completely undermines the spirit of helping people create. Uh, and uh, so they have uh, been running a conference. He has been running a conference uh, called the uh, Decentralized Web Summit. Uh, and uh, there's a lot to applaud in this, I suppose, in many respects, but because what they're really looking at is the architecture of the web uh, and how that could be uh, re-architected to uh, make websites distributed so that if any one uh, source of the information in a particular belonging to a particular website should disappear for any reason that there are uh, backup copies that are live all the time uh, and this is I suppose you could say quite similar to the way Bitcoin works for example with its uh, blockchain technology um, but uh, uh, it's interesting that I mentioned Bitcoin there because perhaps if I'm going to raise a flag about this in some of the thinking here uh, one of the things that they were talking about was new payment technologies uh, and how those uh, could increase individual control over money. But of course, what they're talking about is digital currencies and uh, non-cash currencies, non-cash based currencies. Uh, they're saying that uh, a news site, for example, might be able to uh, uh, have a system of micropayments instead of relying on advertising. Um, so I'm not, I'm not criticizing this in particular. I think there's things we've got to be very, very wary of here, Patrick. Uh, but uh, um, the decentralization aspect of this, uh, there are so many single points of failure in the internet, very, very easy for the authorities to firewall it, to, blo to block it completely. Uh, I mean, we're already s sort of seeing signs that, that certain uh, groups of information, perhaps in the uh, uh, free press rather than the corporate press, um, definitely push down the rankings and so on. Absolutely. You know, we've been blocked and you probably have uh, experienced uh, whole countries, uh, whole regions, global regions, who have been uh, blocked for uh, weeks yes. in some cases. And we know this because our readers are keeping us up to date and we have analytics for global traffic so we can see I mean, completely invisible in some very large markets. Yes. So uh, this is happening. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, in, uh, what, what the strategy behind this is, but uh, I do know that the, a lot of this does go on. Whether it's nefarious or not or whatever, um, we can't benefit from a, a decentralized web. It's good that they're talking about this. However, there's the, uh, the risk of it being hijacked uh, for other purposes. Um, is uh, is always a danger. Yes, so we'll keep an eye on that one and uh, report as, as we can. Um, okay, that's it for today. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Patrick, for being in the studio once again. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. David Scott will be joining us. Uh, and uh, so one o'clock as usual. We hope to see you then. Bye-bye.